Good evening. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Dr. Foley, roll call. President Reese, members of the board, please let the record show that at this moment there are four members present. Our understanding is Mrs. Kaler will be joining us shortly. She'll be just running a little late this evening. Thank you. We will be having a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I move that we approve the agenda as it's presented. Second. Any questions or comments regarding the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries 4-0. Dr. Foley, our information item regarding our mit mitigation strategies. Thank you. President Reese, members of the board, I will allow um, Curtis to pull up the presentation. Thank you. Next slide. As you know, we have been talking an awful lot about mitigation plans. We've been talking an awful lot about mitigation strategies. We discussed this at our meeting last week, and we will be discussing this even more detail at our meeting next week when we talk about progressive mitigation strategies. There was a lot of confusion and questions we received from our community after our last meeting, which in the questions came, well, what does Dr. Foley have responsibility for and what does the governing board do? What did you give authority to her to do and to not to do? And so I wanted to provide a clarifying um, piece up here for us tonight so we understand why are we here tonight? What are we talking about? Um, the distinction between strategy and and board policy. As you know, our mitigation plan has strategies in them, and then sometimes we've had policies that are part of those mitigation plans. Um, mitigation strategies are simple things that are not permanent. They are not, they are not intended for a policy that governs how to do this. They're meant to be temporary fixes for situations. We have them for like heat index, for example, rainy day, when, when there are situations for temporary, Recently, we added the, the component of suspending of visitors. We, why? We would had some of our rising cases included individuals coming on campus. That was one of the ways we could mitigate numbers on campus. Um, so these, again, are simple things that are day-to-day. -day. They are not permanent. On the contrast, when we have policy, policy is, is one of the main responsibilities of the governing board. You, you, you approve and adopt policy. When you approve and adopt a policy, it is up to your administrative team to execute it. It is enforceable. It is kind of the laws that govern our work that are enforceable. Um, they are adopted. They chart the course. Sometimes state and federal laws dictate to us what we must put in policy, and consequently, we cannot have a policy that would violate uh, a law, correct? So that's kind of a little distinction on those pieces. Along that line, when we look at um, our district, we were required last year, we were required by executive order 2020-51 to have a face covering policy. So on August 12th, um, in compliance with this order, we adopted our face covering policy that we enforced. Um, again, on April 19th, Governor Ducey uh, canceled the mandate in his executive order 2110 that said we no longer needed or were required to have one. Um, Higley had a meeting on September, or sorry, April, to, April 26th, in which we made a decision at that time, the governing board rescinded the face covering policy. At this time, Higley does not have a face covering policy. Then this summer, we received additional guidance. Next slide. 
Um, uh, this summer, June 30th, uh, the state legislature passes House Bill 2898 that essentially states basically two points. School district governing boards cannot have anything that required the use of face covering policies for students or staff during the school day and that obviously students or teachers, um, we could not require anyone to receive the vaccination for in-person attendance at any time. Um, one of the things that's important to know is that our, our, our administrative team works all the time Every day we get policy, we have policy advisors and legislative updates through those who represent us informing us This is what this means. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. We can ask questions We, we literally work with these individuals all the time um, In July our legal counsel said listen, it's important for you for for all educators This was to all of our colleagues. This was shared that that um, this bill doesn't take effect, um, and while this bill did not take effect until September 29th, there was components of this were, that were retroactive, so you, you don't consider having this. Um, it was also interesting because this summer some other interesting things happened. Um, currently, um, we don't enforce, there is a federal law this summer, and that law actually had been in place since January, but this summer the CDC restructured that law to say that in any kind of bus or transportation was required, conveyance was required to have mask mandate. In working with our legal counsel, we determined that while they may have restructured that law, we are not enforcing that law on our, on our, on our, our buses because obviously it could be connected to that retroactive clause and it would not, um, we're looking at our school buses not as conveyance systems but an extension of the school day in alignment with that. So hence we did not um, make any conversation about requiring any masks, even on the buses, as per federal guidance to do so. Dr. Foley, we also get that through our ASBA as well. So we all get the emails from Arizona School Board Association to tell us what we can and cannot do, and that mm -hmm. was also part of that as well. Mm -hmm. We were told then that was mm -hmm. what was happening, just mm -hmm. to clarify for the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have learned an awful lot this last, in, in navigating the whole pandemic, one of the things that we have learned is that things change on a dime and information that was true one day is not true the next, and then we, we, we respond accordingly. Um, one of the things that happened this week was that there had been, obviously, there had been in the news an awful lot about the Phoenix Union requiring masks. There was a, a lawsuit in which a teacher sued the district because of its unlawfulness. And there was case law that was decided upon on Monday in which the case law basically indicated, the judge clarified, that the provisions of a statewide ban don't go in effect until September 29th. At that point, I reached out to President Reese and said, okay, we have additional information. Um, this is, she, she's also receiving the information at the very same time, going, what do we need to do? Or the, uh, the discussion was, we need to put a, a meeting on our calendar to schedule it for the governing board to be able to discuss, because you cannot discuss these things without a meeting. So at the time, we scheduled a meeting for tonight for you to discuss the, the compounding factors, so here we are. That was Monday, and Tuesday, things continue to evolve. Next slide. So Tuesday, additional information comes out. Now, we were aware of this information because this was part of the passing of the bill. However, additional information came out yesterday that clarifies how this additional money will be allocated and there are rules for this. Um, I will ask, I'm gonna ask our CFO to just kind of clarify a few little pieces that he's learned because he's been working with our policy advisors, our legislators, to understand and interpret this as emails came in all day, um, and we've been in consultation with that since Tuesday. Uh, good evening, President Reese and members of the board. <clears throat> as Dr. Foley mentioned, this news came out after we elected to have this meeting today. So in um, collaboration with our district policy advisors and legal counsel, we have reviewed the governor's recent announcement regarding the Education Plus Up grant program. The Education Plus Up grant offers non-competitive grants to school districts and charters who receive less than 1,800 per pupil funding under the federal COVID grant, uh, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. Higley is eligible for this grant in an estimated amount of $8.4 million, and the application requires the district to provide the following. One, 
uh, current mitigation plan. Um, in there, it says um, having a mask policy can put us at risk for being eligible for this funding. Number two, agreement that it will follow all state and federal laws, specifically including EO 2110, which was the law removing face mask, face mask requirements last spring, and HB 2898, which is the education budget bill containing prohibitions um, requiring mask mandate and vaccine as a condition of in-person instruction. And number three, agreement that it will remain open for in-person learning as of August 27th and through the entire 21-22 school year. In addition, any district eligible for this grant um, and not compliant with aforementioned application requirements puts himself at risk for not receiving these funds. Um, I also want to clarify the ruling by the Superior Court judge in the matter involving Phoenix Union High School District. The mandate of the trial court in the Phoenix Union decision applies only to the matter of Phoenix Union. But it's unlikely that another um, judicial body will decide differently for any other matter presented now that the decision has been issued. Finally, um, also news today, uh, the president's office responded to this grant program and other similar ones across the co uh, country by directing the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division to investigate and determine whether these grants result in discrimination. So as you can tell, this, this is an ongoing um, process in terms of determining the eligibility and the requirements of this grant. But as of today, that is the information that we have regarding this program. So. And then as you can tell, we have, we scheduled, obviously we're here tonight to have some conversation. One of the things that we felt was very important was the minute we decided it, that we were going to have a meeting to bring this conversation, we communicated with the community so that they knew that this meeting was scheduled for this purpose. One of the things that's important is that we have been hearing from community members all year long. As you know, part of our, our, our part of our mitigation is when there's positive cases on campus, notifications go out. Um, when we look at um, today, um, today, and we are now completing almost our fourth week. Tomorrow will be our fourth week in school. Um, that currently, right now, in our current cases that we have between the resolved and current cases, we are about 258 cases that have happened in the last four weeks of school. Those are a lot of letters that have gone out to family members, and every time they receive those letters, obviously there's great concern and question. What are we doing? How are we doing this? What are the mitigation? Just for comparison, when we looked at the entirety of all last year, the cases that we had on our dashboard from October to May was 567. So within the first month of school, we have already experienced about half the number that we had the entire year. So hence, there are a lot of people in a concentrated part of time who have heard from, received notices as our protocol in our mitigation plan uh, outlines. I want, I want us to share, we have heard adamant and we have heard passionate voices on all sides. We've heard from stories, we, we are hearing people. They have shared their thoughts with us. Part of it, having time to announce that we were having this meeting is it's part of also hearing from our community, and we've heard from them. So with the reason we are here tonight is obviously for the governing board to have the opportunity to discuss all of these pieces. Obviously, we have current factors, we have developing information, um, and we, we are turning to you as the um, elected policymakers of this district to help us determine what do you want us to do at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Like you said, that just looking at the number of our cases, um, so far four weeks into school, we needed to at least have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're doing tonight. I also wanted to <clears throat> point out, Mr. Moore mentioned that part of this grant um, requirements is that we stay in person for the school year. That's not always our choice. We quarantine and if, ha if need be, close a school based on the direction of Maricopa County Public Health. They are the ones we have to follow what they tell us. When we've had to quarantine 
um, freshman JV and varsity football teams um, from Higley High School so far this year. All three levels have had to quarantine. Um, so our cases don't even represent the number of kids quarantined. Mm -hmm. It's just positive cases. Mm -hmm. um, that is at the direction of Maricopa County Public Health mm -hmm. that we don't have that option. Mm -hmm. If our cases continue to rise and the Maricopa County Public Health determines that we have to close a school um, to move back to a remote environment, that is not our option. Um, unlikely that we would have to do that district-wide um, unless we see something different, but that too could, at that point, make us ineligible for that grant with, out of our control because we do have to follow what Maricopa County Public Health tells us. At this time, yeah, our legal counsel is, is saying it's gonna put us at risk. Um, it, like I said, this, this grant just came out two days ago, um, and so litigation or anything has not taken place regarding this requirement, so um, at this point, yeah, anything not meeting those requirements would, would just put our district at risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone have questions regarding the information presented? Dr. Foley, I know we've sent you questions, but I want you to be able to answer some of them that we've already sent. Mm -hmm. um, we will be having another meeting next week. Will you be going over the mitigation strategies that we currently already do and what we're looking to do mm -hmm. besides mass? Yes, um, as we've been talking about, we have a mitigation plan up there, but we've been working on progressive mitigation plans. What are the types of strategies, temporary things that the district could do for in the event of rising numbers? As we shared with our community, there were some minimal ones that we started doing, being that our numbers, as, you're, as you've heard, are rising. And, and again, some campuses, not as much as others, some of these were proactive measures put in place because administrations were saying we've seen we don't, we've seen there's issues that have happened at other sites. Let's not have those come here. We're wanting to keep the numbers low. Uh, on, honestly, the, one of the most important mitigation strategies we have found is to please not come to school sick. We've had multiple times where students are called out of the room in their teacher's classroom when they've been at school and they are not well and they've tested positive, which causes additional frustration and concern. So we're gonna talk through potential additional mitigation strategies, yes. And you've seen drafts of those documents that we're working on with our general administrator team and our teachers union group. I think it's important to say here, even if your child's tested negative, keep them home if they're sick. It's a really good practice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions regarding the information item? Um, can you help me to understand or better clarify what is the criteria that the county is using to make determinations about? Okay. President Reese, Board Member Anderson, there are several components to this. Obviously, every single positive case we have, Jillian and um, Kelly are working hand in hand with Maricopa County Department of Health. There's a lot of factors involved in that, from the date that it tested positive, to symptoms, to last time on campus, to when the case is identified, to when other cases are identified. So there isn't a rule of thumb that always says, well, when there are two or when there's three, then that then triggers. It depends on how the cases happen, um, and we work with them on that. Now, you'll notice, remember, that the, the term for an outbreak, we had several schools have an outbreak. Now, in some cases, they had more than two, you know, they technically say two cases, and then there's a, uh, an outbreak. We might have had more cases on that campus, but they're, they're looking for the epidemiologically linked, and so every scenario is unique. Um, every situation, depending upon the date of when the student was sick, when when the they were tested, when the results came back, the number of cases, how did they come, are there ways that they would have been in similar classes on the same team, not, and then they work with us to help determine when and where that is. Um, the challenge is, is that they are cracking down on 
quarantining. Um, I have been in conversation with multiple, um, our multiple superintendents, and they are receiving calls from Dr. Sun and Jain herself uh, when there's issues and concerns when, when school districts do not respond or follow through on the quarantining expe expe expectations of this. And, and they're quoting the, there's four laws that are connected with quarantining and one administrative code. So in other words, we do not quarantine until we're given the directive to do so, but we work with them on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's not a rule of thumb. It's, a, it's not one, one case um, fits all since scenario. Um, obviously, the goal would be to minimize the potential for having to quarantine. The hope would be if it could be minimally if there has to be a class rather than or a whole grade level before there'd be a whole school. So the goal would be to try and keep keep the, the, the numbers down. If they're going to have to quarantine a substantial number of students based upon a certain scenario or case, then sometimes it's led to entire schools. And, and again, watching the news, you, you see over the last year there have been several who've had that experience experience um, and obviously we're following and working closely with them on each scenario that happens and following the guidance we are we are doing it when we have a directive in order to do so and if I remember correctly um, I believe it was Scottsdale Unified that ended up having to quarantine Six. over 600 mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. last week mm -hmm. I believe is when it was mm -hmm if I remember correctly, at the direction of Maricopa County Public Health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, how does this affect sports? If we put a mass mandate, if we don't do a mass mandate, probably more if we put a mass mandate in tonight, how does this affect our sports teams, especially probably the big one is football, but we have some others out there as well. Um, how does this affect them? What does that look like? What does it look like for spectators who are maybe going to those games? At our middle schools as well, we have lots of stuff going on. So how does this affect it if we do put a mass mandate in this evening? So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Latzenhauser to talk about that a little bit. But, but remember, this one, this policy at this point has been adjusted for just an indoor only. So outdoor event, an outdoor event, um, outdoor activities do not would not have the policy does not require a, a mask. Mr. Latzenhauser. President Reese, Vice President Wilson, members of the board. Um, if you remember last year, we followed a lot of AIA direction that came out and talked specifically about spectators and about the number of attendees and different things that we had to do. It evolved from the football season into the winter season and the spring. This year, the AIA has come out and they've given us some guidelines to look at, but nothing definitive like, like they did last year. Now, are we looking at doing possible reductions of the number of people's attending games to make sure that we have that? Yes, and that's following along with conversations that we're having with the other districts. However, we have not made those decisions yet. But from the AIA's perspective and looking at the guidelines that they're putting out for us, there is not the specific guidelines that we had last year, whether it's people on the bench having to wear masks or at one point while even they competing. Now, there are some districts already, Phoenix Union in particular, that's come out and said, when you travel to Phoenix Union and you compete against us, we're expecting everyone to wear masks, indoors and outdoors, and when you're on the bench, except when you're competing, athletically, however, they're the ones that have put that in specifically for them. But in terms of the East Valley and about where we're at, we, there, none of those things have been decided yet. I'm concerned about that a little bit because I know um, last year we had an issue at one of our campuses uh, where a school didn't want to pay, um, didn't want to follow our rules. So I am a little concerned about making our admin have to make those tough calls. Just putting that out there. I feel for our admin who have to make those very difficult decisions and have to ask for backup to make those decisions. So thank you to all the admin who had to do that last year. It was not fun. We got emails about it. I felt for them. Thank you. And I believe AIA also kind of jumped in a little bit there too, mm -hmm. um, so to try and help. Mm -hmm. But we're, especially when we're visiting a school, it's their school, their rules, mm -hmm. we're expected to follow mm -hmm. them um, out of respect for, for them. Any other questions? All Dr. Right. Foley, sorry. I know you're going to talk about mitigation more in depth at the next meeting. Just to clarify, everything that you're 
doing right now, whether we vote yes or no on it, would still continue in place and you'd still continue to evolve those. Correct. Um, just to clarify for Correct. the community. And you've always been doing these, even mm -hmm. when we voted uh, mm -hmm. to rescind the mask mandate last yes. April, correct? Yep. And these are those additional strategies that are temporary. They are, you know, simple things that can happen, additional lunch spaces or schedules, um, all of those things. Those are temporary things that happen that are not permanent nor, nor a policy issue. Um, mask the face covering because you have you we were required to have a policy for enforcing we removed it this is a policy issue and currently you're making decisions on a school by school basis correct yes and currently there are some similarities because we're just starting with proactive trying to st to stop the extreme number that we're having thank or you compared to relatively to what we had had historically Hi, Mrs. Kaler. We've just finished going over the information item. I know you've had the information ahead and was able to review it. There, okay. So you're up to speed. All right. Does President, or does Mrs. Kaler, Board Member Kaler have any questions? Sorry, I slipped up with President. <laughs> Perfect. All right, if we don't have any other questions for Dr. Foley, we'll go ahead and we will go on to our public comment um, portion of the meeting. We value input from our constituents. This time has been set aside for anyone from the audience who wishes to address the board. Please remember this is not an appropriate venue to evaluate, discuss, or criticize district personnel. Policy KEB provides a process for complaints about personnel. Speakers should be aware that false statements about individuals may result in civil liability. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38 431.01 H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. Only those persons who have completed the request to speak form and given it to the board secretary prior to the start of this meeting will be allowed to speak. Please limit your remarks to three minutes. If there is a large number of individuals requesting to speak, a time, a time allotment for public comments may be utilized. Abusive language or personal attacks on staff or board members will not be tolerated. Individuals displaying this behavior will be ruled as out of order and asked to relinquish the floor and may be removed from the meeting. Thank you for your participation and for helping us con to conduct an open and orderly meeting. And before we get started, I just want to remind the speakers that we um, were all here for one purpose. We ask that everyone be respectful, even with differing opinions. Um, we can not have the same opinion, but we do need to be respectful. Everyone sitting in this room, outside, all of our staff members, um, they all deserve that respect. None of us wanna be back in this position. We were here in April, um, but we're here and out of respect for our community, we're allowing this time for a public comment. There are districts that are not. So we do ask that you please keep your comments um, professional and respectful. We will try and get through as many um, requests to speak as possible. We will be calling people in the order we received them. And I, when I call somebody up, I will let the, I will announce the next person to speak. We do have people in the lobby who have requests to speak, so that will also allow us the ability to allow them to come in as well. So our first speaker is going to be Barbara Summers, and our second speaker will be Mindy Brocker. Is Barbara Summers or Mindy Brocker in here? She may be out in. Okay. 
just want me to get started? All right. I know there's a lot of anxiety today about making the right decision here. One thing we can all agree on is that no one really likes wearing masks. Another item we can all agree on is that in-person learning is beneficial for our learners and being in person is ultimately the best place for our children. That is truly our overall goal and should be our priority. Unfortunately, in our current climate, the issue is how do we do this safely? Pediatric COVID cases and hospitalizations are on the rise everywhere, including in Arizona. Hospitals are reporting COVID admissions among children at an all-time high. Locally, the number of admissions for pediatrics at Banner has doubled monthly since June. In June, the number was 35. In July, it was 71. And in just the first two weeks of August, they had admitted 70 children for COVID. While these numbers seem relatively low, we are talking about hospitalizations and illnesses, and in some cases, even death that can be prevented. When you look at the big picture, the number of known pediatric COVID cases overall in Maricopa County is rapidly outpacing adults by nearly double. I know there is a lot of talk about how we still had cases last year while masked, but as our district mentioned, contact tracing with the county showed that the spread wasn't happening in our schools at that time. This was because universal masking does work. This is evident by the numbers on our dashboards. Overall, last school year, we had 574 known cases the entire year. And this year, we already have 252 known cases at our dashboard in less than a month. And it is spreading at schools this time. Children under 12 aren't currently eligible for vaccination. And with an over 200% increase in pediatric cases in the US since June, we should be doing more to protect them where we can. While numbers seem low, COVID deaths among children this year have topped 350 in the United States, with 35 of those deaths being reported in Arizona. I know it's not what we want, but masks will help stop the spread in our schools. Masks will mean that there is room for treatment at local hospitals if one of our children is injured and needs care. More importantly to everyone here, according to the Maricopa County Health Department, if a student is in close contact with an infected student and both are wearing masks, the student won't be considered a close contact and subject to quarantine. Ultimately, this means less disruption to our students. We can all present data from whatever sources we want to believe, and we can all argue about how we personally feel about masks. But in the end, it comes down to taking care of others. While the idea of the grant funding sounds exciting, are we willing to sell our kids out for that? We need to bring back the masks to keep our children in school and work together as a community because we are in this together. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be... Okay. Can you try and take a look at that? Our next speaker is going to be Mindy Brocker, followed by Megan Jones. Is Megan Jones in the room? Okay. <sighs> to be honest, guys, thank you for your time. <coughs> I'm just going to put it right, right out there. This is like my worst nightmare. I hate this so much. But I need to thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak with you. I recognize that our state government has been actively working against all the district boards, leaving you guys torn between science and politics. My goal for my family is the same as yours, to keep my three children in school. We keep schools open by protecting the health of our children. Our state is trying to punish school boards for keeping local control in the community that they know best. I vote, I volunteer, and I donate to support schools and their funding. This is how we should improve our school budgets. Don't let Doug Ducey put a price on the heads of our children. The feds, States, courts, they'll be battling this out in the coming weeks. Let them fight while we focus on our students. I'm not going to give you statistics about how masks work or best ways to quarantine because I'm not an expert, and neither are any of you. I have to trust that you will rely on your medical and public health professionals. Unfortunately, case count in HUSD is substantial with over 250 Higley children now identified as COVID positives in less than four weeks of this year's start. It's very clear changes need to be made. We should also consider the current rise in RSV cases, another respiratory illness causing many absences. Thank you so much for the common sense modifications you've already made. 
I may not love every choice, but I acknowledge and respect the impossible situation you find yourselves in right now. Today, our community needs to stand up in unity. I'm sorry that I even have to ask for a mask mandate. A request to Higley parents should be enough. But as we all can see, a request to wear masks isn't effective when it's voluntary. I admit masks aren't perfect. A risk will always exist. But we know it's an important tool to reduce our COVID transmission at the source. Please institute a temporary mask mandate to be re-evaluated at fall break. This would greatly reduce the need for quarantines and reduce all respiratory illnesses, further keeping our kids in school. Please follow the Maricopa County quarantine rules. The best source control is keeping children who are actively sick and those at high risk to develop COVID at home for short periods. Finally, please increase transparency, sharing on your dashboard more information like the count of children in quarantine, on-campus transmissions, plus grade level case notices for each school. People will tell me you are doing your best. I wanna remind you, your best requires risk. Just like me standing here is bad. <laughs> but your best is not to pray, hope, and wish. We depend on you. We depend on you in this time of need to make hard choices and be proactive in helping our kids. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Jones, followed by Eric Real. If that's the correct pronunciation. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Jones. I'm a mom and stepmom to five kids, all either currently or previously enrolled in HUSD. I know you, you have heard so much from both sides. I'm sure you've been inundated with laws, science, data, and opinions. I appreciate you listening to them all. I almost did not attend this meeting tonight because my youngest son, a student in the district, tested positive for COVID a few weeks back after being back in in-person school for just a week and a half. Don't worry, I've already tested and I've done my quarantine and he's allowed to be back in school. Um, he's not been able to attend for 11 days now, likely won't be back for the foreseeable future. He still can hardly speak without coughing. I'm sure if you ask him, he would say he'd rather wear a mask forever than to ever feel like this again. I mentioned this to bring me to my first point. When I called to notify the school of his positive test results, I was told that his siblings, who he is with 24 seven, shares a bedroom and bathroom with, are not considered close contacts and need not quarantine or test unless showing symptoms. Yes, I'm here to ask you to reinstate masks, at least until kids under 12 can be vaccinated. But I'm also here to ask you to please do more. The recently released, released mitigation strategies are a step in the right direction, but not enough. Why are we no longer following exclusion guidelines? I've received nine COVID notifications already for Sossaman. How has non, none of these been a close contact when according to my children, there's almost no one masking in their classes? If we can bring our positive case levels down, wouldn't that be the best for all involved so that we can keep these kids in school safely and have less disruptions for teachers and them? I guarantee my son will be behind for months as a few assignments posted on Canvas are just that, assignments. He won't be learning anything he's missed. That brings me to masks. I don't want to mask forever. No one really likes wearing them. I understand that eventually we need to get back to normal. I know that one day, hopefully soon, this will have to be treated like the flu, strep, or common cold. Governor Ducey states that public health officials in Arizona and across the country have made it clear that the best protection against COVID-19 is the vaccine. However, that's not yet available for our under 12 kiddos. In the meantime, the CDC, AAP, NIH, and many others recommend masks as the next best protection. I get the argument about making decisions for our own children, but really, do we actually get to do that anyway? We can't drive, them with, drive with them in a car without a seatbelt or a proper restraining device if needed based on age and weight. They can't ride the school bus unless they and their parents agree to the bus safety rules. Dress codes regulate what they can and cannot wear and even stick with us into our jobs in adulthood. They can't play sports without a physical and proper equipment. People can't smoke on campuses. Heck, DCS has a ton of things you can and cannot do with your kids. There are many things in place already for both public health and safety that regulate our choices. Why is this any different? We trust you to keep our kids safe every day they walk through the doors in any of our HUSD schools. I'm asking you to please take those necessary steps in order to do so. Thank you. All right, Eric Real, and then our next speaker will be Kelly Stramillo. Is Kelly, did I? Is 
she may, Kelly may be in the lobby, not inside. Okay. We go. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And um, thank you for calling this meeting and allowing me the opportunity to address the board directly. A mask mandate is an important topic. I'm glad we again have the opportunity to share collective views about it. Don't want to be here, but thank you for having us. I despise masks. My young kids do as well. It breaks my heart every day to kiss them goodbye through their masks and send them off to their classrooms wearing them. But we do it because it helps keep them safe. It helps keep their classmates safe. There's no arguing that. It's the best defense that my five and eight-year-old and their classmates have against COVID right now. It's their only defense. It's why you should vote this evening to reinstate a face covering policy in HUSD until there are other tools, avail other tools available for us to keep our kids safe from this. Some are saying this is a medical matter, which only parents should decide. Believe me, the last thing I want is the government meddling in my kids' health care. This is not a medical matter. It's a public health and safety matter. It will be a medical decision once a vaccine for young kids is approved and parents can decide for themselves whether or not their kids should be vaccinated. But until that time, this is not a personal medical decision. It's about the safety of our kids in the school community. There's a lot of numbers being thrown around that, about this, but there's only one that matters to me. In less than four full weeks of school, four confirmed COVID cases at my daughter's school in her grade level. That's not acceptable. We need to slow that down, and your best option for doing so is to reinstate masks. These are your choices tonight. Reinstate a face covering policy to help keep our kids safe, or risk a hospital bed, or worse, for my kids, for all our kids. It's a pretty simple choice. Please make the right decision tonight for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have Kelly Stramielo, sorry. And our next speaker, Yulia Redan. Okay. I apologize for anyone I <laughs> butcher their names. I'll, I'm trying my best. Okay, well, good evening to all. Uh, my name is Kelly Stramiello, so you were close. I'm a mother of two students in the Higley District, and it's clear to me that everyone is very passionate about the topic of their children's safety and health, no matter where you stand. I have tried to be a good advocate for my children's health and the health of our entire family. I've tried to read up on, on as many studies regarding the efficacy of masks and other mitigation tools at our disposal. I seek out neutral and well-informed evidence-based sources. Science supports the use of masking as just one of many layers of protection. Uh, the research that I was able to find from studies around the globe show it. The research uh, points to the data that it cuts down on both the chances of transmitting and catching the coronavirus. They are effective in both uh, in protecting against coughs, sneezes, and talking that spray aerosols that carry the virus. That's it. They are, uh, there are no credible studies that suggest that a simple clean cloth mask lowers your oxygen level, uh, increases carbon dioxide in lungs, or weakens uh, the immune system. They are no more a danger to school-aged children than a kid who sleeps with a sheet or a blanket. These studies are found to be credible by many recognized and respectable uh, organizations around the world, such as the CDC, the NIH, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the, Ameri the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society, the American Lung Association, and the list goes on. But the evidence I find most compelling comes from our very own district. Last year, I was impressed with the mitigation protocols we had, and as a result of those efforts, we ended the year with 574 cases for the entirety of the year. As of today, we have hit almost half that number in week four with little to no mitigation. Um, 
our total numbers of resolved and active cases are at 252. That evidence speaks volumes. There are many other mitigations we could and should take to protect our students. And the fact is, we can't predict how it will affect each individual. Uh, we need to work together, uh, using all the tools that we can to stem this tide. Coming, coming up in front of us are the winter months when RSV and influenza will join COVID to make our local hospitals and ERs a nightmare. And if we really want to protect our children and keep the stability of in-person learning, they will encourage their students to follow those mitigation efforts and make the, make the schools and the communities a safer, a safer place. Uh, clearly, we, we all care about kids, but we must take steps to protect all kids while we can. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. All right, Yulia's next, and then we have Daniel Redan. Okay. Hello, my name is Yulia Reardon, and I am the mother of two Higley students. Today we vote on whether to force or not force an untested for safety medical intervention on our children. As a person of science, I am greatly alarmed over mandatory masking policies. To my knowledge, not a single safety study has ever examined the safety, either long-term or short-term safety, of mask use in children. Not a single study was able to show that masking children for eight hours every day is safe. The only studies that looked at safety practices uh, that came with masking show alarming results. They show that CO2 levels were exceeding those determined safe by OSHA within minutes. So why is it concerning to me? I can at least list two physiological mechanisms through which this could be greatly harmful to our kids. Concern number one, multiple studies that I personally read show that various cancers, including breast cancer, thrive in low oxygen environment and grow much more aggressively in tissues where oxygen perfusion is suboptimal. Where is the evidence that prolonged use of masks in children does not increase the risk of pediatric cancers? Such evidence does not exist. Concern number two, when CO2 sensors in our brain detect increased CO2 levels in the blood, they deploy compensatory mechanisms. One such compensatory mechanism is by making our heart beat harder and faster. From what we know by studying these compensatory mechanisms in adults with heart failure, is that our heart, when our heart is forced to beat stronger and faster over time, the walls of the heart muscle become abnormally thick, allowing less blood volume in each chamber of the heart. The scientific term for this is compensated heart. Compensated heart is a stage that we observe before the heart gets too tired to compensate that way. The heart gets too tired to beat harder and faster over a long period of time. And then it goes into a fail decompensated mode, which is weak and flabby heart that can no longer perform optimally. So, where is the evidence that prolonged mask in children does not increase their risk of compensated heart? Such evidence does not exist. If I had more than three minutes, I could bring many more concerns that science support. There is no science, however, to say that masks protect from COVID or flu. Our children's chance of dying from COVID is zero, 0.0% statistically across all states. Bottom line, this medical intervention has not been proven safe. Children, my children are not your guinea pigs and we will not comply with mask mandates. Please vote no, let parents decide. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel. Daniel Rudin and then Travis St. Denis is, is he okay. in, he may Hello, be in. Hello, I have uh, 
two kids in the Higley High School. There is nothing you or any policymaker can do to stop the spread of the Delta variant. Much as the flu, COVID is here to stay for the rest of our lives. And that's the bottom line. Forcing children to mask up holds as much common sense as banning the driving of kids around due to the chance of dying from a car crash. Actually, it makes even less sense, as the chance of dying from COVID for kids is lower yet. And wearing those masks does nothing at all. There's not a single data or study to show that those masks do anything beneficial. The, horm sorry, the former head of CDC, in effect, confirmed that fact. While there is nothing beneficial or effective in forcing children to mask up, there is a lot to suggest that this is a nasty way to go through one's childhood. Those parents who wish to force their children with this draconian measure are already doing so. As for the rest of us, the vast majority of us, I ask few, let us be. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Travis St. Dennis, and then we have Hannah Burgess. Hannah Burgess. All right, so I, I got three minutes. I'm going to fumble through this as fast as possible because um, I don't think I can get through all of this. So to start, parents of Higley District, I'm not here to address the border district. I'm not concerned with their opinion or agenda. I'm here to call to action the willing parents to stand for our children and to resist the tyrannical powers of these schools they think they have. All executive orders giving emergency authorization to the counties, towns, and districts have been rescinded. They no longer have the authority to even talk about this topic. The enforcement of masks is a violation of current laws on the books, such as Parental Bill of Rights, ARS 1602, which reads, all, parent, all parental rights are reserved to a parent of the minor child without obstruction or interference from the state or any political subdivision of the state, any other governmental entity or any other institution, including the right to make health care decisions for that minor child unless otherwise prohibited by law. There are no more laws to it or executive orders suspend, suspending state law or giving them the authority they had in 2020. There are no <clears throat> laws prohibiting our rights anymore. The arrogance of the district to think they can dictate our lives. The majority of our teachers in the two schools my children attend do not wear masks. They obviously don't want to. I'm talking about the super majority of teachers are not wearing masks. They just want to teach and genuinely engage with our children. Further, the overwhelming majority of parents are not sending their kids to school with masks. Trust me when I say us parents and teachers are fully aware of the current COVID situation, and we've made our voices loud and clear. That is, leave us alone, we will not wear your mask. Your absolute power and reign is over, and it's obvious the districts are drunk with power, flexing a power play in resistance to the state of Arizona. The overwhelming majority, and that overwhelming majority who chose not to participate in the COVID propaganda. I'm calling on all parents to resist. Do not comply. The criminal actions of this district cannot be tolerated. ARS 36114 titled Limitation Upon Authority to Impose Treatment reads, nothing in this title shall authorize the department or any of its officers or representatives to impose on any person against his will any mode of treatment provided that sanitary preventive measures and quarantine laws are complied with. <coughs> Governor Ducey just reiterated this in his executive order yesterday and reiterated that that is a class three uh, misdemeanor. Do not allow these tyrants to criminally violate our rights and our children. Do not comply. Teachers, we got red for ed. We believe you're here with good intentions to educate. We'd like, we would like to not, <clears throat> and you would like not to be pawns in this propaganda. We're asking that you get just as passionate for our children. Do not comply. Do not let them violate your rights. Resist. Do not show up Monday with a mask unless you truly want to wear one. That is your decision and it is respected. We will resist your criminal action and take whatever steps necessary to defend our children. I spent the majority of my adult life fighting overseas as a recon Marine and Marine Raider, which is the Special Forces units of the Marine Corps. I've done unforgiving things for the ungrateful. And is this what I came home to? A population that can't stand up, will not risk being uncomfortable and own what they believe? Are we that complacent and scared that even when there's no risk to life or bodily injury that we cannot stand up to and defend the future for our children? We will, not be, we will be the death of freedom, us, our generation. We will be responsible for the decay of American values because we're scared. Is that it? And I don't believe so. We will resist. We will not comply. Stand up and save tomorrow for our children. <clears throat> and Thank you. I'd like to, I'd also like to, to clarify, I know the majority of the board likely is, is not for this, so please don't take that personally. Uh, this is more for the rest of the state and the parents that uh, need to stand up for, for what they believe. And I also Thank have... You. I also have, uh, uh, I also have a Thank lot you. of science here. 
I also no, have a lot. Thank of, you. Okay, thank you. I also have thank a lot you. of science here because I know everybody likes to talk about science. Uh, some CDC okay, stuff. Okay, sir. Thank you. A lot you. of things here. If anybody else wants to read it. Uh, okay. I'll leave it up here. Thank but, you. Um, yep. We would like to give as many people a chance to speak. I'll pass this out. Would you guys like Thank to read you. This? These, are facts. These are facts, not opinions. Would you like to read them? All right. Hannah. And then our next speaker is Adelia Sinta? Sincha? Good afternoon, and thank you to members of the board and staff for listening to what I have to say. My name is Hannah Borges, and I am a registered nurse for 13 years with experience in the hospital. I am here today because I do my best to live by a quote, which is actually an Arabic proverb that says, the greatest crime you can commit in a desert is to find water and remain silent about it. I have found water, and it's not being spouted from the dry sources like the news. Sometimes with water, it's not at the surface, and you just have to tap into it. At the beginning of this pandemic, that's just what I did. I read countless articles, research, and studies to uncover the risks of COVID. Many were afraid, and I wanted to find out as much as I could as facts were not being disseminated quickly enough. I found that hand washing and promotion of personal care and health was the best way to prevent the spread of COVID in the community, and even taught hand washing to my son's class two days before spring break of 2020. Now fast forward a year and a half, and the science behind hand washing continues to be effective and is the best way to spread to prevent the spread of infection as does staying at home when you are sick or you have a fever this is because when you are sick and as and symptomatic viral loads are high this is the time when you are most able to spread an infection conversely asymptomatic people are not cause for the spread of covid those who are healthy should be free to go to school without a mask it should be a choice that each individual and their families make not the school district Let's talk about the efficacy of surgical masks. First, you have to understand the size of the virus. The virus responsible for COVID is 0.12 microns in size. The influenza virus similarly, and also incredibly small, is 0.08 to 0.12 microns in size. To put that in perspective, the width of a hair shaft is 150 microns in size. Now you can see comparatively how very small these actual viral particles are. A surgical mask is not designed to block out very small particles. In fact, studies show it rarely blocks out any particles smaller than 100 microns, or two-thirds the size of a hair shaft. In other words, the COVID or SARS-CoV-2 virus people seek to block out with a mask is nearly 1,000 times smaller than the many holes invisible to the naked eye that exist in a surgical mask. This truly is the equivalent of putting up a chicken wire fence to keep mosquitoes out. It's not going to work even if we are all confined behind our own chicken wire fencing. Now, cloth masks have no quality controls and vary accordingly to the materials with which they are comprised. But not shockingly, they fall into a category even less efficacious and block out between 10 to 30 percent of only the large particles. Here, the particles that make it into your mask get tangled up into your spit for you to breathe in and out during the day and thus become a breeding ground for bacteria. A layperson can see that this is not healthy and does not model the standard for healthy behaviors. Now that I have the science out of the way, I want to talk about freedom. Just the other day, the world witnessed be people from Afghanistan gripping onto any part of a moving C-17 airplane as it took off from a Kabul airport. We as a country witnessed the links that people would go grasping onto a freedom that they felt was still within their reach, only to tragically find out that it was actually too late. Will this soon be a metaphor for us? What are we going to do? Are we going to recognize this before we get to that point? Let's please not free fall to our demise because somehow we think it's easier to conform than uh, to the constant m moving of the goalposts. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Adela. And then the next one I have is Ashley Shaw. Is Ashley's in here? Okay. Uh, first, may I address a question to you? Is it about a mandate till uh, September 29th or for the whole school year? She's asking if because it will from continue September 29th, on. the law says that you cannot mandate a mask. What is being so considered is September 29th. What is being considered would in September 29th when the law becomes effective. Okay, thank you. Uh, mask mandates teach students that their environment is toxic. They have toxic teachers. They have toxic colleagues. They breathe toxic air. 
There are many peer-reviewed studies that show that wearing masks is harmful, and none that shows they are beneficial. But NCBI, part of NIH, study from November 2020, children wearing masks may suffer of the following. Hypoxemia, hypercapnia, shortness of breath, increased lactate concentration, decline in pH levels, acidosis, toxicity, inflammation, self-contamination, increasing stress hormones level, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, increased muscle tension, immunosuppression, activation of fight or flight stress response, chronic stress condition, fear, mood disturbances, insomnia, fatigue, compromised cognitive performance. Legally, you have no standing to mandate mask wearing because if you do so, you will be in violation of federal law as face masks are under FDA emergency use authorization. Title 21, United States Code 360 BBB 3C 3E, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act states, individuals to whom the product is administered are informed that, number three, of the option to accept or refuse administration of the product. So on. Emergency use authorization products are by definition experimental masks and thus require the right to refuse. Under the Nuremberg Code, the foundation of ethical medicine, no one may be coerced to participate in a medical experiment. Consent of the individual is absolutely essential. In a letter dated April 24, 2020, the Food and Drug Administration stated that authorized face masks must be labeled accurately and may not state or imply that the product is intended for antimicrobial or antiviral protection or related uses or is for use such as infection prevention or reduction. Any emergency use authorization mandate requiring individuals to wear face masks conflicts with Section 360 BBB3, which provides that the person must be informed of the option to refuse to wear the device. Our students should be taught they have individual freedoms and not collective mandates. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have Ashley Shaw and then Drew Young. Is Drew Young in the room? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Ashley. I have two elementary school kids at Coronado Elementary. We transferred in from Chandler to do the dual immersion program. Um, last year and a half has been hard for my family, especially my small children, um, as it is for a lot of families as we try to navigate this. They, my children, have no control over the situation and have to constantly change and adapt, and our expectations of them are really high. As a society, we're saying, hey, here's this thing you have to meet in order to get this, and it changes day to day, hour by hour, um, and the kids are doing it the best they can. Um, my nine-year-old and seven-year-old asked me to come today. They, um, I asked them if they wanted to come and they were embarrassed, um, but they said they do not want to be forced to wear a mask again. Um, my son's words were, please don't put me in a mask, it's really hard for me. So I'll quickly read some of their reasons. <clears throat> my, both my kids said, it's hard for me to understand what my teacher's saying in class. I get embarrassed having to ask her to repeat herself over and over. They also are taking Mandarin. Sometimes they don't know how to say the new Mandarin words because they can't see their teacher speaking, and so they have to ask privately to the side during recess to have the teacher move their mouth with the word. Um, my seven-year-old daughter told me that it's hard for her in class because she's soft-spoken and the teacher can't hear her, and she often feels invisible in class. Um, my son says <clears throat> he gasps for breath when he's trying to read aloud in class for the class to hear. Um, and the hardest was when we moved into the district last year, they didn't know what their friends' faces looked like. 
Really quick about my kids. Um, they both received speech services, um, and there was zero improvement and actually regression this last year for them. Um, once the masks came off at the end of the year, they jumped right back in and had huge improvement again. Um, when, their when the mask mandate came off, um, they were both overwhelmed with emotion to finally see their friends' faces again and to see them cry about being able to see their friends' faces was tough as a parent. Um, I have deep empathy for everyone, including those who have been directly affected by COVID. I respect their individual choice, everyone's individual choice, whether or not um, they wear a mask or whatever they choose to do to keep themselves and their family healthy. And I hope that I would have the same respect to choose how to protect my family. We have come to an informed decision that the benefits of not wearing a mask for us far outweigh the benefits we would get from wearing a mask. Um, I would just want to thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have Drew Young, and then I have Carrie Ware. Is Carrie? Okay, perfect. Thank you. I have uh, three kids that attend the Hegley School District, as well as I'm a spouse of, a, of an employee. Um, I found it interesting that the president brought up possible discrimination in reference to, to the grant when a medical mandate, regardless of what the mandate is, is in fact discrimination. This should not be a political issue, but I can't help but feel like this vote is taking place in order to be a CYA for this board and district against those that would choose to blame them for any future positive COVID diagnosis. If you truly have the kids' best interests at heart, that sounds like the perfect time to have your legal team bow their neck. In essence, that's a legal issue, not the opportunity to sacrifice our kids in the name of not fighting for our right to choose. Those in favor of a mandate seem to forget that it's not just a small sacrifice. We have all had our first day of kindergarten, our first crush, went to prom, and went to graduation. The mental damage that these mandates have done and would continue to do cannot be undone. It's not a small sacrifice. These experiences cannot be given back to these kids. It's easy to cancel and restrict when you have already enjoyed the very things that you're taking away. COVID cannot be eradicated. It's not going anywhere. Judging whether to disrupt lives and make medical decisions for people should not depend on your positive cases. So how often is there going to be a vote on whether to disrupt lives and make medical decisions on the behalf of your parents? This should not be an argument of whether you're pro-masking or against it. This is whether you're gonna infringe on people's right to choose. Kids and employees right now and far before COVID had the ability and right to choose whether to wear a mask. You're voting on whether you're gonna remove the right to choose. There's nothing preventing those from, uh, that feel they should wear a mask from continuing to do so. If I was for wearing a mask, I would be saying the exact same thing. I have no right to tell anyone in this room or district how to raise their children or what is best for them medically or mentally, and neither do you or the state for that matter. It is in this board's best interest to put the political football back where they found it and continue to let people choose what's best for them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have Carrie Ware and then Denine Schmidt. Okay. Hi, good evening. I'm Carrie Ware. I'm the one that says at HUSD all the time on Facebook, Facebooking you guys. I'm a little irritated sitting here listening to everybody. Thank you so much for letting me speak. We have to work as a community to get this taken care of. I have never in the 16 and a half years that I've been a mother solicited advice from any of you people or anybody for that matter, and I do not plan to start today. I cannot control what's going on in the White House, but I can control what's going on in my community. And I love the people in this community, and I love the kids in this community. But there's one thing that everybody in this room is forgetting. You guys are up here acting like you're doing us a favor, giving me the option of A or B. That is not freedom. That is coercion. That is you telling me I have two options, and that's not the case. Freedom means I bring to the table what I want to do. And what hypocrites all of you are to stand here and pledge to the flag, which represents freedom, and then tell me I have two choices. 
Nonsense, I'm over it. My family is done doing what you tell me to do. This is America, this is Gilbert, the people are proud, the people are here to tell you we're not gonna do it anymore. There's half of the population for the schools aren't even here tonight. Where's the survey? Did you guys get a survey? Anybody get a survey? Did the teachers get a survey? Did the parents get a survey? So don't act like you care what we think because you don't. You guys are gonna decide at the end of the day, no matter what I say or any of them say. If you really cared, you would have asked. And let me tell you something. I have a kid at Higley, a kid at Sossman, and a kid at Centennial Elementary. I got three different drop-off times and three different pickup times. And every day, the teachers don't wear a mask, the kids don't wear a mask, nobody's wearing a mask. But we're gonna have an emergency meeting five days from now to implement a mask policy a few days from them. What an emergency. If you guys can't figure out by now the science is ridiculous, then you're probably driving around in your car with a mask on by yourself and I can't help you at this point, nor do I want to. It's not my job. I appreciate what you want to do for you and your family. I would appreciate it if you respected what I did for me and my family because that's where we live, the United States of America. God bless America. The end. Thank you. Janine. And our next speaker will be Colleen Hernandez. Is Colleen inside? She might be in the lobby. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I am here to oppose the mask mandate being considered by the Higley Board at this time. But I have one question that I'd like to ask everyone here that is making this decision. I'd like to know how many of you would have the audacity to ask someone who is in favor of wearing masks to not wear it, to demand that they take it off or that they will be sent home, to take it off or they can't go into a building, to take it off or else. I'm guessing that you all would say that science wouldn't support the forced unmasking of students and teachers. Well, you know what? Science also doesn't support the forced masking of students and teachers. Dr. Fauci himself said they don't work and that they provide a false sense of security. He's changed his mind since then about everything from here to there and was caught lying about this subject. But that's besides the point, or is it? What are we to believe? Well, what I believe is what I've seen. I've seen my daughter get COVID last December and was over it in two days. She felt worse when she had the flu than when she had COVID. I've also seen that while my daughter had COVID, none of our family was infected, nor were any of her friends that she spends more hours with in a day than she does us. What I've also seen is a coworker who locked down for nine months, didn't go out at all, and when she finally did, she masked up like her life depended on it. She ended up with COVID, pneumonia, and meningitis. Did self-quarantining, locking down, and wearing masks prevent her from getting sick? No, it didn't. In fact, I would argue that doing so weakened her immunity system and made her more susceptible to it. While I feel that no child should ever be forced to unmask because I'm not fearful of this virus, I do not feel that others should force my child to mask because they are. Keep masks optional. Getting sick is a part of life. Being exposed to various germs and viruses is what strengthens our immune systems. The common cold, the flu, and this virus are not something that can be blocked by masking. That has been proven. People were getting sick even when masks were mandated. End this already. Please keep masks optional. We've had enough. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen Hernandez. We didn't have one out there. Okay. Set that aside. Oh, is that you? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Come on up. No, that's okay. The next one is Sean Shaban. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, the Hickory School District has continued to tell parents since the pandemic began that they would follow the guidance and recommendations from the Arizona Department of Education. As of today, the Arizona Department of Education is recommending universal and correct use of masks as the top mitigation strategy for safe in-person learning as recommended by the CDC. The Department of Education strongly encourages all individuals in public schools to wear masks on campus and during school associated activities. As parents, we are not asking the board to mandate masks for the remainder of the year or to make it some part of school uniform. This is a mitigation strategy because we are asking that while the numbers are high, while there is an outbreak at Higley High School, which isn't, those aren't my words, that's the principal's words, and while there is a pandemic, that you consider the facts of the numbers and our children's safety. When masks are worn, the numbers are lower. I'd rather have my kids in school with their friends than at home online. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sean, and then we have Kari Pendleton. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sean Shahan. Uh, I come from a teaching family. My dad was a coach, my uh, brother is, and I, I taught uh, high school as well. I'm gonna go right into it, Stanford study. Data suggests that uh, both medical and non-medical face masks are ineffective to block human-to-human -human transmission of viral and infectious disease such as SARS and COVID-19, supporting against the usage of face masks. German neurologist Margarita, uh, Margarita Breeze Brisen, who has done extensive studies on this, says children have a very active immune system as well as developing brains, which thirsts for oxygen for proper development. To restrict oxygen to a child is not only dangerous to them, but is criminal. The damage to the brain and the damage because of it cannot be reversed. Journal of American Medical Association, recent, out of 45 school children, six to 17 years of age, 100% reached at least four times the OSHA permissible limit of CO2 exposure in nine minutes. The Irish Health Authority, after looking at the mental health and the physical ailments, ailments of their chul, uh, children, ruled masking children in classroom is not a legitimate medical option, it's child abuse. Exasperates anxiety, breathing prohibits proper development language and social skills. CO2 levels were felt, found uh, well above dangerous. Breeding ground for bacteria sickness using scientific research. There is numerous scientific evidence supporting not using masks. There is not one supporting the use of masks. There are suggestions, maybe we ought to do that. As one of the people that came up here, Fauci on May 28, 2020, said that masks are not effective, the virus can enter there, and actually it's prohibitive to the help of it. He then changed his mind and said, use 3, 15, 12, whatever. This is not science. I can go to a restaurant, take off my mask, and sit down. My kid can't sit in a chair for eight hours without having his on. How's that science? Well, it won't get you outside, but it'll get you inside. My child played basketball in middle school. These kids were gasping for air, gasping, and refs were stopping the game and telling them to put it over their nose. What are we doing? Follow the science, they said. I am. What a change of pace. We have study after study after study after study saying the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the development is killing our kids. There's a report that the little ones, after a year of this, their IQ on average went from 100 to 78. Suicides are up 500%, anxiety, depression up 242%. Have you ever tried getting a therapist in this valley for your child? They're booked out for a year. I need you to stand up. I need you to protect our kids. If you wanna wear your mask, you wanna get vaccinated, I support you as a parent to do that for your child. No one's preventing you from not wearing a mask. If they work, wear one. But don't make my child go through a mutual. I had to pick my kid up twice for having panic attacks. Pull her mask down because she can breathe. Protect my kid. Do what's right. Stand up. Thank you. So I have Kari, and then I have Danielle. Okay. 
Hello, my name is Carrie Pendleton. I'm a parent of two high school boys at Williamsfield High School. Our family is new to the district. We transferred here from Gilbert School District this year because they were still enforcing masks at the end of last year, even after Governor Ducey lifted the mask mandates. We toured many schools in various districts and we settled on Williamsfield because they are in the Higley District who voted to do the right thing and make masks optional. I am here to tell you my boys will not be wearing masks at this district either. I do not authorize you to make medical decisions for my kids. My older son has given up half a season of football. He has to sit out as a requirement by AIA for transferring. He loves football. He has lost some friends because they're calling him a traitor for switching teams. But he feels that passionately about not having his freedoms taken away. It's bigger than a sport right now. And you can go ahead and insert any activity important to you or your child as an example, as an example instead of football. It's a really big deal to miss half a season as a junior on varsity in high school. My younger son, a freshman, said at this point he'd rather just drop out than put up with this again. Everyone in this room that stood for and spoke the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to remind you that it ends with liberty and justice for all. Liberty, which is defined as personal freedom. Personal freedom that, if you have access to the news or any media sources, you have seen images of people falling off the plane trying to get to their freedom. I don't understand why any of you would vote to have our freedoms taken away. I don't understand because unlike some people in this room and in this district, my life has not been taken over by fear. Fear is the only thing that could drive someone to give up personal freedoms to this extent. To wear a mask because you believe it makes you safe from a virus that can't be blocked from a mask is irrational. Irrational thinking created by fear. It is a security blanket, nothing more. You might as well just put up a chain link fence, like my friend back here said, to block out the mosquitoes or flies in your yard. But that is neither here nor there. I will not tell you what you can have to do. Go ahead and exercise your right to mask up, vaccinate up, keep you and your family safe the way you see fit. In that same light, do not block mine and my children's rights because my thinking differs from yours. If someone came up and berated you and forced you to unmask, you'd understand where I'm coming from. You'd be angry, you would tell them that they have no right to do that. Be honest with yourself. You say you don't wanna discriminate, Kids that don't want to wear a mask will be the only ones discriminated against as they won't have an option. Do the right thing, better yet, do the American thing. Thank you. Thank you. After Danielle will be Kristen Apodaca. My husband and I have a freshman at Williams Field. One of the biggest reasons we chose this district is because we felt a sense of patriotism, freedom. Freedom of all parents to be able to choose what's best for their own, child, own child. This freedom is not taken away from those who are supporting the mask mandate. The pro-mask individuals believe their, if they believe that the masks work and they're protected by them, no one is stopping them from wearing them. Freedom is taken away from those of us who do not want our children to wear a mask. Through my own countless hours of research, I understand the negative effects masks have on uh, our children's health. This information is coming from doctors, nurses, pediatricians, virologists, other healthcare professionals who have nothing to gain and everything to lose by speaking out against these mandates. When our ch kids have a mask on their face throughout the day, it's cutting oxygen to the brain. It's really important to consider because the brain continues to develop until age 25. And the kids are in that stage right now, that critical stage of brain development. With a mask on the face and constantly breathing in their own carbon dioxide for countless hours throughout the day, this can be dangerous for many reasons, but especially the respiratory system. There's much evidence and statements, even on the CDC website, as well as on the box of the masks themselves, stating that the masks do not protect anyone from getting COVID. It's a virus. The particles in the virus are so minute, it's nearly impossible for the virus to not pass through the much larger fibers making up the mask. It would be like shooting a BB gun through a chain link fence. To date, there is no proof that a child has infected a teacher or caused death in any school in the entire world. The kids, it, when they do get sick, so they're typically the symptoms are fairly mild. The death rate of COVID amongst kids is 0.003%. That's a 99.99% .99 survival rate, and there has been no report of a healthy child that doesn't have underlying conditions that has died from it. Instead of instilling fear in our children and teaching division, why don't we focus on teaching them to be proactive with their health by boosting their immune system? Let's educate them on eating healthy, exercising, drinking water, getting enough sleep, reducing stress, 
It's, it's as though we've lost all of our common sense. There's nothing stronger than our God-given immune system when we take care of our host. To me, the saddest thing of all is what this is doing to our kids' mental and emotional health. We're already seeing the ramifications. Currently, there are not enough therapists to support the growing need of mental health support. In 2020, suicide rates increased fivefold. Anxiety and depression are at an all-time high amongst our kids. Our kids are meant to be social. They're meant to see each other's emotions and facial expressions. They're meant to be able to see sadness, happiness, anger. They're meant, as we all are, to have human contact and interaction. Our kids are already losing social skills in large part due to social media, but also because they're being suppressed. So I'm asking you, please, let our kids be kids. Let them see and feel a sense of normalcy in a really abnormal world. Please do what's best for them in this district. They need us, all of us, to advocate for them. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Apodaca, and then we will have Will Gordonberry. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kristen Apodaca, and I have four children who attend schools here in the district. I stand before you today to ask you why. Why are we here doing this again? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, which is exactly what is happening. We did masks last year. It did not solve anything. There were still kids who got COVID and still kids being quarantined with the mask mandate in effect. What will mandating masks do for five weeks? There is zero logic behind this. It is another attempt at throwing something at the wall to see if it will stick. I am asking for common sense and logic to have a place at the table tonight. Once again, the goalposts are being moved. Every time we get closer or achieve the last goal, it, swiss, it swiftly gets moved further out. It started out that we could drop these mandates and resume a normal sense of a school day once the teachers could be safe. Safe meant when they had a vaccine available that could protect them. That day came and became available for all those teachers. And yet here we are again being told once it's safe. The Queen Creek School District what has remained, <clears throat> excuse me, mask optional since last year, as has most charter schools in our area. Did they collapse? Did they need to shut down? Why are we not using them as an example of how it can be done safely? Masks being optional has always been an option for those who felt, feel it necessary for their family. No one is taking their option to choose a way. And in doing so, those schools have maintained a safe environment for all. This virus is not going anywhere as we have already seen, and we have already tried by mandating masks before. We have to learn to live with it in the best way possible. The mitigation plans that have been put into place over the last week is another example of the lack of logic that creates these rules. Hurting children in one direction down a hallway or a set of stairs for our middle schoolers all at one time does nothing for their safety. Cramming kids all together to move to their classrooms, taking their ability to walk across the hallway away has no merit for safety. If anything, it's creating other safety hazards. Taking morning recess away from our elementary children, no longer allowing them time to be outside, getting fresh air, sun on their skin, getting their wiggles out, once again, has no merit in safety. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here before you to speak and to take a stand for our children, but as a parent, that is what I am here to do. I am here to stand up for my children. I am asking you, the members of the board, to do the same. Members of the board, if you took on this job for the children, then please be courageous. Set an example for our district and our children. Our children are not for sale, and they are not a bargaining tool in this political game that continues to be played in our public school system. Deep down, I know you all know what is happening is wrong. The only way to stop it is by stopping it. Please keep masks optional. Thank you. Thank you. We have, well, and then our next speaker is Larry Shrimp. Shrimp. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. All right. So uh, I'm a father of, of two Higley students and a Higley taxpayer. I uh, want to thank you, board, for listening and for your service on the board overall. I know it's a tough job. 
Uh, I also wanna thank you for your example tonight in making a personal decision as to whether to put a mask over your face or not tonight and potentially risk harming us all by not covering your face. Um, <clears throat> COVID stats, everybody's talked about a ton of stats. Um, looked at CDC today. As of yesterday, since this thing started, 430 deaths uh, under the age of 18, the large majority with terminal illnesses. Uh, the previous year, flu stats, flu is, was non-existent somehow last year, but the previous year there were over 600 likely flu deaths according to the CDC. So the flu is literally more deadly than COVID is, yet we've never masked up. None of us growing up, we never did any of this stuff, right? We never had dashboards, any of that. Uh, however, the psychological impacts are real. People have talked about those as well. SSA.gov did a study. They said that over 50% of children have suffered severe impact on mental health due to COVID and the COVID response, I might add. My son, William, fifth grader uh, at uh, Bridges Elementary, he's an HPAL, 97th percentile on the testing last year. He's, he's such a loving kid, bright and outgoing. Um, he's become angry, uh, depressed. Uh, he lashes out far more often now. And just this past week, through tears, he shared with my wife, in his words, he just can't take this stuff anymore. So we, the, the impact to our kids is huge. And as it's been said, I, I think it's permanent. <clears throat> so if masks, if this thing isn't harmful to our children, why do we wear masks? Is it to protect adults? Every adult has had the opportunity to get vaccinated already. And even if it is, even if they haven't, it's not a child's responsibility to protect adults. It's adults' responsibility to protect children. So with that in mind, it's not in my child's best interest to wear masks. And as loving parents, we will not comply with any mask mandate. The government of these United States is by the people for the people. We are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The people do not want to mask their children. Our country was built on liberty, and we demand the right to choose whether to mask our children or not. ARS 1-602 number five has already been stated, but it's, it's against Arizona law to make health decisions for our children. So if a mandate is brought forth, my children will be forced to unenroll and take our tax dollars elsewhere. As taxpayers and citizens, we will vote with our feet in regard to how our children are educated. Uh, it's been mentioned the, the fiscal impacts as well. You'll lose, you know, eight point something million dollars uh, in terms of, of the Doug Ducey um, funds there. So in summary, a vote for mask mandate will restrict freedoms, negatively impact children's mental health, and take money away from our district, all without providing any real health benefit. Please make the right choice as you did in April. Thank you. We have Larry, and our next speaker is Kim Collins. Okay, she's in. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak um, tonight. Um, I realize this is a highly charged topic and everybody's got an opinion. You're gonna get criticized either way you come down on it. But uh, anyway, I just wanna commend you for giving us a voice for the people here in the public. Um, really, I just wanna talk about two studies uh, that have recently come out. The first one, it was talked about in an article last month in the uh, Wall Street Journal. It's called, In Children, the Risk of COVID-19 Death or Serious Illness Remains Extremely Low, a new study finds. Um, and I'll just read a bit from it. It says that children are at extremely slim risk of dying from COVID-19 according to some of the most comprehensive studies to date, which indicate the threat might be even lower than previously thought. Some 99.995% of the 470,000 children in England who were infected during the year survived, one study found. In fact, there were fewer deaths among children due to the virus than initially, than initially suspected. Um, in fact, only 25 of those 470,000 infected students um, died due to the illness itself. And my understanding is there's limited studies on the Delta variant, but based on the limited studies, it does not appear that that's any more um, dangerous to children than the original strand. Um, the second study is from the CDC's own website. It's called the Physiological Burden of Prolonged PPE slash Mask use on healthcare workers during long shifts. Uh, basically, it says that the N95 mask um, is always going to uh, 
N95 mask users are always going to experience some level of difficulty breathing or breathing resistance, even though these devices are designed to minimize breathing resistance as much as possible. Enough breathing resistance uh, can result in the reduction in the frequency and depth of breathing, known as hypoventilation, which is basically a CO2 overload. Um, some of the side effects that they've found uh, from, not, from uh, CO2 overload is uh, headache, increased pressure inside the skull, nervous system changes, increased uh, pain threshold, reduction in cognition, altered judgment, decreased situational awareness, difficulty coordinating sensory or cognitive abilities, uh, monitoring activity, decreased visual acuity, widespread activation of sympathetic ner nervous system. Um, those are all the direct effects, um, as well as increased work of breathing, cardiovascular effects, uh, all the things that everyone else has, has, has already mentioned tonight. Um, one other thing of interest in that Wall Street um, Journal article is they, they mentioned that, uh, it went on to say that a child has a greater risk of dying from the flu or drowning than COVID. We don't send our kids to school in life jackets to keep them safe from drowning. Um, I don't think we should send them to school in masks to keep them safe from COVID. Thank you. Thank you. President, President Reese? Yes. I wasn't here, I know, at the beginning, but can we have some of the people that are waiting in the lobby come sit down since there's empty seats, or was that not allowed earlier? We just hadn't done that, so it's not disruptive. Okay. It's good. All right, so we have Kim, and then following Kim is uh, Jan Jana McLean. Okay. Good evening. Um, as a parent of two students here at Higley uh, Unified School District, in my opinion, masks make sense. As an educator at a Higley Elementary School, my opinion is masks make sense. This variant COVID is different. It's different because it's affecting elementary age students. It has the ability to affect elementary age students. These same students are unable to be vaccinated. In my opinion, masks make sense to reduce the communication of COVID at our schools. My ask today is that we protect Higley's students by making our campuses requiring masks as a mandate. That's it, short and sweet. Thank you. And then after the speaker, we're gonna take a short recess, so if at that point additional people want to come in All right. okay I am NOT a doctor a nurse or a scientist but I am a dental hygienist and have a bachelor's in science and my career is literally based in preventing disease I wasn't originally going to attend tonight because 40 days of masking isn't going to do any appreciable good in stopping the spread of COVID just like that initial shutdown that was only going to be two weeks long obviously that didn't work but I realized something I was planning on wearing a bikini top tonight and Daisy Dukes, but I lost my courage. Why am I saying this? We have a dress code in place, most places including in schools. The dress codes are to facilitate learning in a safe environment. Not wearing a mask during a pandemic does not facilitate a safe learning environment. If we can make a dress code for the length of shorts and skirts, words that are on a person's clothing and hairstyles, surely we can make a dress code for masking when there is a highly communicable disease. My son is six. He wears a mask when he is with me, but he is refusing when he is at school. I was told I would have a choice if my kid wore a mask or not. I don't. So to say that um, he's not doing it because he's saying no one else is doing it. So it's actually more of a peer pressure thing. Kind of like if everyone else is jumping off a 10 foot bridge, are you gonna do it too? I guess he would. For those people who are saying that their child would be outcasted if they did not wear a mask, that's already occurring. The kids who are wearing a mask are feeling outcasted and feel like they're embarrassed to wear a mask. Kids tend to be like their parents, so if the parent is verbal and anti-mask, it's highly likely their children, especially younger children, will be exactly the same. I'm not big on punishment, 
but I do believe in consequences. There is no logical consequence for my son not wearing a mask that is related to him not wearing one when he's at school. Not going to school really isn't a good consequence. And the only other consequence would be natural, and that natural consequence would be him acquiring COVID. I had to test my son on Thursday night of last week. Thankfully, he was negative. He was really congested. I think it was just allergies. That's what most of us are saying, right? It's just allergies. But I got a letter on Tuesday that a COVID positive person was on the, his same bus. He sits in the bus for 20 minutes waiting to leave the school. He likes riding the bus and the bus is a main factor in why we kept him in his district school. Today, we got two letters, another from transportation, another kid is sick, and that a first grader is sick, the grade that my kid is in. This did not happen last year. We received zero letters. He went from January until May. If you look at the dashboard, it is evident that the cases are up. Let me go over some common arguments against masks. Dirty mask, wash it. You can easily hand wash and dry a mask overnight. Buy multiple masks if you need to and rotate them. But I also find this argument contradictory because people say, well, they're not getting into contact with germs because they're wearing a mask. Well, if your mask is dirty, then you're getting into contact with germs. Breathing in the, the mask fibers. You breathe in dirty air all the time. We have multiple red flag days. All this to say, I am asking actually that the district put in a temporary um, dress code while there is a pandemic going on, asking for the kids to wear a mask. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to take a brief recess, probably about two minutes.
Okay, thank you. We're going to go ahead and resume our meeting. Um, we will we will have ten more speakers, um, and then we will close public comment. So I have Logan Geronimo, and then Mark Eltwell. Okay. Thank you. Three elementary aged children, and I was not at any board meetings last year because I withdrew from Higley upon the mask mandate. I chose to homeschool them to avoid the risk that they'd be in masks 33 hours a week. If you do a web search for a Times Magazine article titled, Hospitals Overwhelmed by Flu Patients Are Treating Them in Tents, from January 2018, that's January 2018, you will find a quite similar hysteria to today. The article includes inundated hospitals across the country, including New Jersey, Alabama, California, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Missouri seeking, quote, extraordinary measures such as asking staff to work overtime, pulling nurses from all floors, setting up triage tents, restricting friend and family visits, the use of ventilation due to respiratory failure, and canceling elective surgeries, just to name a few, end quote. Alabama also declared a state of emergency. I have copies here of that article if any of you would like to see it. In that 2017-18 season, the CDC estimated that 600 children died from influenza, and during the 1920 season, they estimated 434 juvenile deaths. In the past 18 months, the CDC estimates a total of 332 children, I heard somebody else say updated to 350, have died from COVID-19. So those previous flu seasons had more deaths despite a widely administered vaccine and lower case rates. So what's the difference between the response in 2018 and that of now? It's been over a year since the medical community has navigated and learned about this virus and provided vaccines to everyone who feels they are at risk. An analysis published by the Financial Times in an article titled, Why Are Fully Vaccinated People Testing Positive for COVID? found children at a 0.0002% less risk from COVID-19 than vaccinated adults. In fact, a New York Times article titled, Kids, COVID, and Delta found that children are about 10 times more likely to die in a car accident than from COVID. So who are the masks meant to protect? What is the difference from 2018? Why wasn't there a demand to mask up then? Is it because there is suddenly a new revelation that masks can protect others against asymptomatic viral loads? Not quite. Leading up to 2020, several randomized controlled studies had found that masks can hardly be deemed effective at preventing the spread of disease. The CDC pointed to one randomized controlled trial, which concluded, quote, this study is the first randomized controlled study of cloth masks, and the results caution against the use of cloth masks. This is an important finding to inform occupational health and sa safety. Moisture retention, reuse of cloth masks, and pore filtration may result in increased infection. Again, that's increased infection. To date, there is yet to be another randomized controlled trial completed to show that masks are any more effective or even safe to wear. So again, who are these masks meant to protect? Thank you. After this, our next um, following mark will be Michelle Judd. Okay, perfect, thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for having us here today and give us the opportunity to speak on this issue. And I do not envy the difficult position you all are in. Um, my name is Mark Altowell, and I'm here tonight as the grandfather of two, two children in Bridges Elementary. Um, I just wanted to th throw out some facts. I'm sure everybody's reading and, and, uh, and keeping track of what's going on, but I haven't heard a, a whole lot of facts tonight. I've heard a lot of passion. Um, over the, according to reporting from the state and from the Children's Hospital Association, over 160,000 of our Arizona children have gotten COVID-19, and um, sadly, 34 have died. There are vaccination programs underway for those 12 and over, 
but those 12 and under don't have the opportunity to get the vaccine yet. And even for those over 12, at 44% vaccination rate, we're lagging the national average and we're well behind our neighbors to the east and the west, um, both of whom are well over 60% vaccinated. So we need to continue to do more to help protect our children. Arizona has the sixth highest rate of childhood COVID infection of all the states in the US. And that rate is nearly 50% or actually over 50% higher than the national average rate. We are not doing enough to protect our children. The rate of children being hospitalized is accelerating. So contrary to what some people think, that kids aren't really getting sick and going to the hospital, the rate of children going to the hospital is accelerating. It's now 10% higher than it was just two months ago and 15% uh, uh, higher than it was just three months ago. Just this morning, Valleywise uh, Health System reported that their hospital is seeing uh, an increased rate of pediatric admissions and is uh, imploring, asking us as, lead, as, as parents, as adults, to do something more to protect our children. I'll, I'll end where I started. Over 160,000 of our children have gotten COVID-19 and 34 have died. We're the adults, we're the leaders. We need to do everything we can to pre prevent these deaths from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have Michelle Judd and then Kyle Speck. Okay. <clears throat> Do masks reduce COVID transmission in children? It is nearly impossible to find any study answering this question, and the results on this are inconclusive. Of the 42 billion the National Institute of Health spent on research last year, less than 2% went to COVID clinical research, and not a single grant was dedicated to studying masks in children. While there is an absence of data in the case of masking children, there is a plethora of information on the case against it. Before schools decide to start forcing children to cover their faces, regardless of the non-proven efficacy of such a decision, let's consider the harm. Many children struggle wearing a mask, Children who wear glasses can struggle to see because the mask fogs their glasses. Masks can cause severe acne and other skin problems. Some students may experience anxiety or difficulty breathing while wearing a mask. Increased airway resistance during exhalation can lead to increased levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. This can lead to dizziness, excess fatigue, and headaches. Some children compensate for such difficulties by breathing through their mouths. It is well documented that chronic and prolonged mouth breathing can alter facial development resulting in a mouth deformity and elongated face. The, the psychological harm this may be doing to our children should be an even greater concern. Facial expre expressions are integral to human connection, especially for young children who are still learning how to communicate. Covering a child's face mutes these nonverbal forms of communication and can result in emotionless interactions as well as anxiety and depression. Young children need to see people speak for their phonetic development especially children with speech impediments. I have personal experience with this with my three-year-old son. He needs to be able to see his teacher's mouth move. He also needs to be understood without the impairment of a mask. If safety measures are to be implemented, we should be implementing safe safety measures. We should not be choosing a safety measure that has more risk associated with it than reward. Children who wish to wear a mask are free to do so. Forcing children to wear a mask and make personal health and developmental sacrifices without any proven efficacy is not only abusive, it's lunacy. Thank you. So after Kyle is Karen Stanley. Yes. Okay. Good evening, governing board. Uh, my name is Kyle Speck, Master Sergeant, United States Air Force, retired. The reason I bring up my uh, service is because I gave an oath to support the, and defend the Constitution of the United States as well as the people of this country. My question to you is, what are we doing here? I sat in this room about four months ago, went over the same topic, came to a conclusion, voted four to one to get rid of masks as a mandate. Leave it optional, right? <laughs> to my... To my knowledge, there's no city, state,
county requirement that this meeting even, even takes place. No other schools, to my knowledge, are even having this meeting. My guess is because of the cases. That's what I've heard people talk about, right? So let's talk about the cases. The PCR test exclusively used for COVID-19. The CDC and the FDA have said that that test cannot differentiate between the flu and COVID. 18 months of this, 18 months. 2019 to 2020, 38 million cases of the flu. 2020 to 2021, there was less than 3,000. That makes you question something, doesn't it? Let's talk about mask effectiveness, right? We've been told, let's follow the science. Okay, so let's follow the science. There are zero peer-reviewed clinical trials showing mask effectiveness. Peer-reviewed clinical trials, by the way, are the highest level of scientific evidence. There are at least three peer-reviewed clinical trials showing the ineffectiveness of masks. Not only, not only do they offer the findings, not only do they offer zero protection, but they found that, the, uh, that they cause harm to the wearer. And the, more, the longer you wear it, the more harm. Pneumonia, heart, heart disease, gum disease, and then psychological and mental. And that's really important for kids, right? We're make, making them wear masks, they don't get to see faces. In closing, I'd like to ask you one question. What message are we trying to send to these kids, right? They, so we started out, don't, Fauci says, don't wear a mask. Then he says, wear a mask. Then he says, then don't wear a mask. Back and forth and back and forth. At the end of the day, what we're going to do is we're going to vote here. And if you vote to put them in a mask, it's going to be for five weeks. That doesn't, that doesn't, send, that doesn't send a clear message to these kids. In all my time uh, in the military, I, did, I, I spent a lot of time in leadership roles. I can tell you that if you vote to put the mask as a mandate for five weeks, it will not give any confidence to the students of your level of leadership. So please do the right thing and give our kids a choice. Thank you. Karen Stanley Stately. No. Okay. Joanne Loki. And that will be followed by Charlene Styers. Hi, my name is Joanne, and I have two children currently attending Higley Unified School District. Tonight's vote is a drastic step to address the concerns about the spread of COVID. Anyone over the age of 12 may get a vaccine, and everyone can wear a mask should they so choose. The choice should be voluntary and in response to one's personal situation. It should not be a mandate that has not been scientifically proven to actually work at slowing, stopping the spread of COVID. The CDC cites a study that emphasizes that a particular type of mask needs to be worn in a very specific way so that it can, quote, possibly may help, unquote, slow the spread of COVID. Why such squishy language if it works so well? First, the spirit of the House Bill 2898 was to apply it to all school districts as students return to campuses for their new school year. The idea that Higley Unified School District Governing Board is taking advantage of Maricopa County Judge Warner's judicial ruling on Monday, August 16th, to discuss imposing a mask mandate is very disappointing. The lawsuits will continue to be filed, giving opportunity for this school district and others to continue their mask mandates for as long as they want to. Tonight's vote, if a mandate is put in order, will not end on September 29th. I'm not sure people understand that. There are lawsuits saying that this bill isn't legal. It will continue the mask mandate to go on and on and on. Second, if a mask mandate is to be imposed on the children, what is the metric that is being used to decide to require mask wearing? The district's minimation mitigation plan does not seem to include any such metric plan. As such, how many Delta variant COVID cases, hospitalizations, or deaths in a week have to be recorded to mandate mask wearing? To lift the mandate, what do the numbers have to do to go down? Would the metric be applied by Higley Unified School District or Maricopa County? Again, we heard from Dr. Foley and she was giving various metrics that would be followed, but they were all squishy, no real numbers. I want numbers. 
Third, in March of 2019, the American public was told to, quote, shut down and shelter in place for two weeks to slow the spread of COVID. Today, August 19, 2021, we are in our third, third school year and are still having to respond to arbitrary mandates that may or may not have any real effect on the spread of COVID. What are we doing to our children, to ourselves? Everyone is so concerned about getting sick. By the way, people seem to forget what having the flu actually means, that they do not consider for a moment the negative impact of the emotional, psychological, and educational effects of these arbitrary mandates on adolescents and adults. We are destroying ourselves in the so-called process to save ourselves, and it needs to stop. Thank you. Charlene Styers. We will go on to Angelina Abram. Oh. oh. <laughs> so I didn't prepare any remarks tonight because I wanted to come and speak to you from the heart. And your name? Charlene. Okay, Styers. I just wanted to make sure. Thank yes. you. So I am glad to get the chance to do that because I could stand up here for my three minutes and spout off facts a lot of people have, and I appreciate that. But the real fact is you're going to find what you're looking for. We are all divided here. There are parents just as much on one side as another, and I get that. I get that because there's not a parent in this room, and I think we can all agree on this, or outside, and by the way, there's a lot of us outside, that wouldn't lay down our lives for our children. I think we can all agree on that. So when we come here and we talk about facts and we talk about numbers and we talk about cases, that's all fine and dandy, but we're just gonna go back and forth like a volleyball game. The real fact is, it's my child. I see the whole picture. I don't see numbers. I don't see statistics. I see my child. And things you can't see was my three children that attend your school district last year and all the effects all the majors had on them. And I'm not faulting anyone because I feel like everyone was trying to do the best they could in an unknown situation. And it would be an impossible one, but we're not there anymore. We have a lot of information. We've seen things that worked, we've seen things that didn't work. And honestly, there's no difference out there. If you look at everything, you're gonna find what you want to find. I can spit off facts, I don't have to. I will tell you what happened to my kids though. My fifth grader had the worst emotional year of her life. Not just from masking, although that was huge, but from social distancing, from zones, from zones that kept her from talking to her friends at any point in the school day. I send my kids to get an education and I send them for socialization. All of that was removed last year out of fear. And again, that was last year. You were doing the best you could. This is now. We do not need surveys, although we all appreciate when you send them out, but trust me, we feel like you're not listening. When this numbers come in really high one way and you make a decision the other way, you're not listening. Use your eyes, go to the drop-offs, go to the schools now. We are not saying you can't wear a mask. I guarantee you anyone that wants to put their kid in a mask can do that now. We're not stopping you, do it, please. I've taught my children to be respectful of others and their opinions. So do it, and we'll try to be kind one to another. Know that we're on different sides of this. Know that everyone is struggling with this, no matter what side you're on, and be respectful of that. All we're asking is that you don't take our choice away from us. The same as it's been mentioned, you would not be okay if I stood out front and took the masks off your children's faces. If you feel that's protecting them, you would not be okay with that. So please do not force my children to put one on. My child is in the dual language program, and there's a lot of things besides masks. There's the zonings, there's the one-way hallways. It all has an effect on them. The no recess, the no lunches, it all has an effect. It all needs to be considered, but at the end of the day, it's a parent's choice. This is easy, just leave it up to the parents. That's all we're asking. Thank you. Thank you. Angelina Abraham, Abram. Amy Faust. 
And then Julie Hancock. Is Julie Hancock in here? Okay. Uh, my name's Amy Faust, and I'm a parent of a first grader in HUSD School District. Contrary to the second speaker, there's a lot of experts here. I've heard a lot of them speaking. We're all parents. We're all experts on our own children. But I've heard a few other experts speak. There's a few people of science. They've spoken to the science. There's a few military members. They've spoken to freedom. I'm a licensed professional counselor. My field is psychology. What they've been saying is true. You can't find people like me to work with kids. We're inundated. I've been slammed since the pandemic started. And I can't take on any more kids. I can barely take on any adults. And that stinks because our kids really need help. This is hurting them. I sent letters to all of you, and thank you, Michelle, because you're the only one that acknowledged receipt of my letter. So I don't want to recite everything that was in that letter again. I can talk about statistics like everybody has. It doesn't matter. Like the last person, it's like a volleyball match. It just goes back and forth. We all have our opinion. But I'm here to speak to what's happening to our kids. The rate of suicide is skyrocketing. We're losing more children to suicide than we are to COVID. We need to pay attention to that. The mask mandate harms our kids. They can't see each other's faces. They can't see our faces. They can't see the faces of teachers. That is so vitally important to their emotional and, develop, their emotional and social development. Kids up until the age of 14 haven't mastered social skills yet. They're looking to us. They're looking to their teachers. They're looking to their peers to figure out how to communicate. And never mind kids that have autism and Asperger's. They suffer their whole lives. If we're masking, we're making it even worse for them. How are they supposed to learn? We're telling them, look right here. Look me in the eye, look at my face. Am I smiling? What does that mean? In therapy, we have face symbols, and we ask children, pick the symbol, pick the face. What emotion are you trying to express? They're looking at their peers, they're looking at the adults in their lives, and they don't know. When I'm at a grocery store and I'm not wearing a mask, I smile at everybody I see, because I want people to know that I'm friendly, that I'm a person they can trust. But when I have a mask on, they don't see that. I'm still smiling, but they don't know that. They're looking at my eyes, it looks like I can't see because I'm squinting. How are they supposed to be able to read that? We need, we need to keep masks off our children. The data supports it, but as far as I'm concerned, that data doesn't matter what I'm getting in my office every day, what's coming into my practice is what matters. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Please hear us. We need people to keep masks off our children. We are the experts. The parents are the experts in our kids. Our kids need to be able to see their faces and ours. Thank you. Thank you. And this will be our last speaker. Good evening, Dr. Foley and board members. Thank you so much for once again taking the time to read our emails and to listen to the community tonight. April 27th, 2021 will be etched in my memory as one of the best days in my teaching career. Even though we were nearing the end of the year, of a very long and stressful year, and I'm usually burnt out a little bit and um, very tired, of working, I could not wait to get to school. I could not wait to see my students. This was the day, thanks to you, that we were able to take our masks off. You see, I teach some of the youngest learners in the district. I teach students in preschool, three, four, and five years old, with developmental delays and speech delays. I wish you could have been there to hear the noise and the language that was coming out of these kids. There was an energy in the room that you could feel, and in the halls. The parents were happy dropping the kids off. The kids were happy. The teachers were happy. And that, again, comes thanks, thanks to you. So again, I thank you for letting us end last year on a high note. My students made so much progress in just that last month. And now I have some of those same students in my classroom again, and we are continuing that progress. 
If we return to masking, my students will be going backwards, and that is not an acceptable direction. Here we are again voting to either continue using masks or not. I'm here to, again to ask you to please consider the physical, social, emotional, and the educational needs of our special needs students who cannot speak for themselves. They need to be able to see our faces to learn and to learn the language. They need to be able to not be hindered by two or three layers of fabric that from what I have seen is not clean and is so filthy you wonder, how can this even be healthy? Finally, I'm here to ask you to please allow families to continue to choose if they want their child in a mask. Because if we don't, I fear that many families will continue to use their choice and choose to leave Higley. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers for coming forward and sharing their thoughts and information with us. It's not easy to get up there and speak. Um, and we really, we appreciate it. Um, I believe at last count we had over 200 emails um, that we've received. Even though they may not have been answered, I can tell you every single board member read every single one of them. Um, I was still reading emails 10 minutes before our board meeting. So we have received them, we have read them. We know um, what our, our community is thinking. We also know that this very topic is very divided with different viewpoints. So again, I appreciate everyone coming to speak. President Reese. Mrs. Wilson. I too want to echo that I have read over 200 emails. I did not respond. As I mentioned in the last board meeting, I would not be responding. I'm going to reiterate that. I did not respond to any of them. There was actually one that did get a response. She didn't tell me which side of the fence she was on, but she did get a response. That was the only one. Um, I will say our community does not have a lack of passion for something that has truly divided our community. I have a speech that I read in fall 2020 when we were coming back to school. Um, I read it again in spring 2021, and I'm gonna read it again. So uh, Mr. Tom, for the paper, here it goes again. You'll probably quote me. We have divided our community. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Whatever decision is right for you and your family, make it. It's the right decision. Please don't judge others for their decision. You don't know what they are dealing with. Save me, safe means something different to each family and each person. Some feel safe, others do not. That's okay. Please continue to be kind and show your kids kindness matters. I'm gonna say that one one more time. Show your kids that kindness matters. Something to remember tonight we will lose families, probably, with our vote. We understand that. But kindness goes a long way. And maybe we should tell our kids tonight, whatever way we vote, that kindness is important. Let's be kind to the friend who decides to wear a mask or the one who can't wear a mask, whatever it takes. So that's all I have to share. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. Therese, can I ask a, a couple questions based on Absolutely. Um, first, uh, Dr. Foley, one of the speakers mentioned that their siblings were not quarantined when we had someone with COVID. Is that, what's the, can you explain that a little bit? If you'll recall this summer, uh, we talked about the progressive, or we talked about the mitigation plans, we talked about the exclusion guidelines, and that our guidelines match the health department. And at the time, they had, you know, loosened up those guidelines, and, and where our guidelines now are currently the appropriate guidelines. Um, again, those might those might continue to be changed, and, and obviously we they, we are in those meetings every week, and Jillian updates as needed. When we bring, you know, again the updated mitigation plan, they will reflect the most at the time. But currently, ours are updated. Okay, thank you. I just wanted clarification for the community mm -hmm. on when she mentioned that, and then uh, one. Uh, I have two actually. Um, if masks were implemented, uh, 
would there not having would there wouldn't be quarantine as far as what we're having to do now correct as far as the football teams and i'm just want to like a good question well last year when we had mass there were times that even quarantines were required because there were times when depending upon the circumstances if um quarantine quarantining happened obviously when we were directed to do so we did um one of the things that had happened was the there was the primary and secondary exposure and that's one of the things that in the guidelines that was sent today from dr sun and shine is the proper fitting mass when there were students around them if they, if there was a person who was positive and they identified that they potentially needed to quarantine if they had been wearing a mask they then didn't need to quarantine but in some cases even if there was they were they were and so again depending upon the scenario and, and I appreciate the, the context people saying it feels smushy it is it's depending upon every situation um, the contact the exposure the date of it it is it is hard to to be cons it is hard for it to be identical yeah thank you thank you I just wanted to clarify it for everyone in the room and the question mm -hmm. or what's being stated and, and mm -hmm. the direction doesn't come from us it comes from um, mm -hmm. County Health mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mrs. Schultz, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Foley, those, when we were wearing masks, the ones that were quarantined um, were groups through contact tracing, had contact outside of school. That, that's why while they were wearing masks in school, groups may have been quarantined through their contact tracing that there may have been a group event that they were together at that masks weren't worn is or, or a sport a sports activity or group in which there was prolonged exposure in which there was the potential for most many and in most cases there's uh, multiple cases of positive within a short amount of time that shows that there was exposure at that point so thank you it's squishy as you mentioned. squishy is a good word mm -hmm. for sure all right, I'm gonna go ahead and make the motion that the policy EBCF be reinstated until September 29th of 2021 when House Bill 2898 goes into effect. Is there a second? Okay, there is no second. Therefore, that policy will not be going into effect. President Reese. Mrs. Taylor, can I make a comment, please? Absolutely. Um, I, I too, Mrs. Wilson, read every email, and um, I appreciate the passion of this community very much. I, uh, I want to share an email I got tonight, today because I too, I just, I couldn't respond to every memo. Mrs. Anderson, if you do that, hats off to you. Okay. <laughs> but, um, so I'm gonna read this email. I asked the writer for her permission to share it tonight. She did not write me back, so I will not use her name, but I think she kind of summed up what a lot of us are feeling, and I just um, wanted to share it. She writes, I know tonight is probably gonna be rough. I do have an opinion one way or the other, but I just wanted to thank you for the job you do. I'm sure you get praises when the vote goes the way the people want you to vote, and I know you get mean, awful emails when you vote the opposite way. It's a no-win job most of the time, but I'm grateful you spend the time away from your own families to try to be best at your job. Even if you vote differently than I want, I don't want that to change. We are all humans just trying our best. I listen to both sides, and I sympathize with both. I hope you can separate this part of the job and ignore the negativity. Have a blessed day. And that's what I want to end with tonight. Board Member Kaler, that is the one email I responded to. I didn't get to see that email, but <laughs> I just want to say one thing. Uh, my, the most important to me is to keep our schools open. And so if that means not sending your kids to school when they have a sniffle, please don't send your kids to school because as we've talked about all night, it is not at our direction that we have to shut down schools. I want my daughter to go to science camp. I want the kids to play football. I want them to go to prom. So 
and, and I respect everyone that's wearing a mask, but I want to be able to keep the schools open. And that is the most important thing to me, that we be able to keep this normal for the kids. And I used my eyes and I saw what the community wanted and that's the way I voted tonight on, on what I thought that the constituents and the people that voted me into office wanted me to do. Well, and Mrs. Schultz, let me, let me also remind our community that the motion is a formality. It is on our agenda. So there is a formality of motion. Um, I too hear you, I've, I've heard our community. Um, and I just wanna, I, I don't want this to fall on deaf ears and I know that's what a lot of people feel. We continue to receive emails from teachers who have children in their classrooms in the morning that they get an, a notification from their parent that they had to come pick them up because while they were at school, they got the results of their COVID test and it is positive. And that they had sat in that classroom and in high schools gone to, I don't know how many classes in the morning around so many students without a mask, and I get it's optional, but they sat in class while they were waiting for the results of their test. That is irresponsible and everyone, you're right, you have a choice to wear a mask. Please be responsible, considerate of others, do what we can to try and slow this spread down. Masks don't stop it, we understand that. It could help slow it. We need to do our individual parts. Everyone has that right, but we need to be responsible and considerate of others. Please, if you are waiting for a COVID test for your child, do not send them to school. Again, we get these emails consistently from teachers and it's not that it's putting our teachers at risk, it is, but they're putting many, many students at risk. And while those statistics may be fairly low right now, it doesn't mean they'll stay low. And so we need to do our parts. So I don't want this to fall on deaf ears. We have hurt our community. We do want it to be optional, but we have to be responsible. So I, I appreciate everyone speaking tonight. We have heard from our, our community. Um, and I can tell you, in my mind, not at one time did the governor's grant come into a factor of my decision. It is not about money. It is about our kids. So I just, as our district moves forward and we still navigate this, and we have cases go up, and we have cases come down, we're gonna see ebbs and flows of this. Absolutely, everyone who said this is not going away, it is not going away. Hopefully sooner than later, it will be more like the flu that we're not having these large outbreaks within our schools and our communities that are impacting our kids. COVID in itself has had a huge psychological impact on our kids and our community, even as adults. You know, we've, looking around the room, I don't think Anyone here has been through anything like this, and it has been trying and challenging for all. So I just ask again what Mrs. Wilson said, please let's model kindness for our children and respect the uh, choices of everybody. Parents, send your kids in mask if you want to do so, um, and we will continue to move forward. We will continue to operate within our confines of what the Maricopa County Public Health Department allows us to do. And our goal is to stay in person. We know that remote learning, that was the hardest social, emotional, psychologically um, challenging for our kids and for our parents. They were ready for our kids to be in school and they need to be in school. So. Just everyone, please be courteous and responsible, and um, we will move forward. I do want to note quickly, um, Representative Mr. Jake Hoffman was here uh, when we were doing public comment. Um, I saw him leave, but I do want to recognize he was here. Um, we were doing our public comment, so he didn't have an opportunity to speak, but um, I just want to make that noted. So with that, Anyone have anything else? Mrs. Anderson? I'll make it quick. We've been here a long time. We've heard a lot of people speak. So <laughs> thank you. 
Um, I didn't read all your emails. I couldn't sit with that being said, and I'm sorry, um, but I want to, um, and I will. It just will be delayed. Um, <laughs> going off of what Ms. Uh, President Reese said, but, um, yes, be diligent, but I also want to thank those parents that have kept their children home. I know it's a tough decision to make because there's a lot of school that is missed, but I appreciate you doing it. The numbers reported by students, I'm sorry, teachers and, have, and myself, we've had a lot of uh, students out. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, I'm just gonna, with the one thing that stuck out, I don't know who said this in their uh, email to me, but the one thing that stuck out, stuck out was the comment of keeping masks off because of the children's attitude towards school. Right there, I was moved, and that's, that was the moment where I realized that that's, what really, that's what really matters, is we get these kids in school, and they're happy to be there. They are safe when they, when they are there, and we are glad that they are in school. Thank you all for showing up tonight and speaking. It takes a lot of courage, and I'm so glad all of you spoke to help, help us to fully understand what you're all experiencing. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. And to those who didn't get to speak, we apologize. We still had more requests to speak than we had even gotten through. So we appreciate everyone requesting. We appreciate um, those who spoke. And I'm, I'm sorry if you had requested to speak and did not get to. With that, I move we adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good night. <laughs>